I found it. So. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining. It is Seeking Sustainability Live number 34. Can you believe it? And we have Paprika Girl with us today. She was Seeking Sustainability Live number 13, I believe. And now mm -hmm. she's back to give us more insights on kimono and coming up to warmer weather kimono. And she's going to give us some insights on yesterday's talk and geisha kimono as well. So we're very excited. Thank you so much for joining us, Paprika-san. Do you mind if we start with some of the photos from Dave and Osaka's talk yesterday? He, oh, that would be very nice. He showed such beautiful photos um, from his video. He watched a geisha performance in Kyoto. And when we were talking about it, I was thinking, oh, I wish I could talk to Paprika-chan, because I have so many questions. Um, <laughs> could you give us some insight on the kind of kimono that they're wearing? All right. So um, what they're wearing here in the uh, these black kimono you'll find, it's called a tomesode. And a tomesode, it's it's just a very it's a standard style of kimono, which is um, it can, doesn't have to be black. It can be any color that you like. But it has a mon. There has a crest on the sleeve, and the style that most geisha are wearing, they tend to have um, five ikitsu mon. So there's five mon. Two here, um, one here, one here, two on the um, sleeves, and one in the middle in the back. So um, the ones that they're wearing are called kuro tomasode, of course, because it's black. And at the bottom, they have all these different kinds of colors and um, patterns, which are either painted on or they're woven into the pattern. And um, what's interesting about this particular kind of kimono is that you don't use a hashiori. So usually, you can see on my kimono as well, um, you'll have a piece of material which is folded, folded under and over. And this is done for practicality's sake. So a kimono, like I think I mentioned this last time we spoke, but a kimono is meant to be worn for over many generations. And so when it's given to someone who's younger or shorter than the previous generation, then they have to tuck it in in order to make it fit lengthwise. And so to have more of a hashiori is considered something, um, it means it's a, it's a better kimono or more modern kimono is what they're trying to say. But as you can see, what they're wearing with a tomesori, they take out the hashiori and they actually allow the thing, it's called kinagashi where they allow the kimono to be worn and dragged behind them. They do this because the silhouette of the woman, it looks even lovelier. It's kind of sexy, in yeah, other words, right? Yeah. You'll, I don't know, you can't see from these particular photographs, but one of the elements of um, geisha in general is that they use very wide um, collars. You can see, um, uh, not in this one, maybe, maybe, oh wait, you can see here in the bottom right hand, you can see that there's a lady, she's wearing a collar that is, that's hiked all the way down like a U. You can see her white back, right? Mm -hmm. That's the same thing as a lady wearing a short skirt. Okay. Yeah. It's a nice, it's, it, you want to show how elegant and slender and pretty your neck is. And in order to make it look longer, because we ladies, we go to use all sorts of tricks and things like that. We like to um, lower the eddy in the back as much as possible. You know, to give a little bit of a you know, hint of what's beneath, you know. And um, geisha especially, they'll use a lot of white in their eddy in the front, too. And depending on, of course, how their body underneath is made, you use an extra white or less white, or you widen this or, or tighten this. It's whatever is most flattering to you. But you'll notice that anyone who comes from um, that, uh, they call it Mizu Shobai background, where it's selling water. In other words, we don't really have anything to sell, but we're going to show you something anyway, right? It's called Mizu Shobai, but a Mizu Shobai background tends to have wider and looser eddy than someone you'll see, for example, at a formal tea ceremony. So, um, God, it's absolutely beautiful. It These, is um, gorgeous. And the, the theme of the design is water, is it? Is it the water current? Well, the um, you can see the... It, it depends on the time of the year, generally uh -huh. speaking. He said but, this was New Year's, special black kimono for New Year's. Well, um, these kuro tomes, so that you're going to see this year round, but the patterns uh, the patterns on the ones you're seeing right now are exceptionally gorgeous. Mm -hmm. So there's lots, of, um, there's lots of embroidery there. Well, um, one of the interesting things, the difference between Maiko and Geisha, you can see partially in the, in the hair, 
You can also see in the color of their eddy. So a mica will have a red eddy or a patterned eddy, whereas a geisha will have a white eddy. But um, once, supposedly, once you have a good patron, right, and patron doesn't necessarily mean the same thing as what you think it means. It's actually just someone who has a lot of money who wants to show off that they have a lot of money. So to own a geisha means to bring them up. It's, it means to pay, it's paying for everything that they have. So it's paying for their art lessons, it's paying for their dancing lessons, their music lessons, their singing lessons, but it's also paying for their kimono as well. So um, the if you're a geisha, you're Michael, you're still kind of in training, so you don't really get too many patrons, of course. But um, as a geisha, to have a kimono which is embroidered or very expensive or has a lot of gold in it, it means that your patron is is probably very well healed. And in addition to that, um, he's showing off to all his friends. So they're doing all these performances in a zashi, which means that they are specifically called in for that party. But it's going to be their patron and their patron's friends who are calling them in to, to wear those things and show off. Look at how amazing my patron is for giving me this wonderful kimono. Um, and it's, it's wonderful. I, I noticed few... the obi as well. The back of the obi is folded in some of their kimonos and then some is loose. Is there a special meaning for that? Um, these are two different kinds of folding here. The okay. looser ones, um, which are falling down, are probably Michael. Okay. They're probably not Michael yet. Um, they do that, you know, because it's showy. And, of course, the, the um, obi is the nicest, supposedly the nicest part of the kimono. It's the most expensive part of the kimono. So they want to show as much of that as possible. And they're like um, little peacocks because they're very young girls. These are like um, 16, 17-year-old girls. And so you're young and you're pretty and you want to have all those little glitzy things. And so they're, they're young and pretty and showing off their, their um, obi in the back. The ones that are um, are like nagarikiru, the ones which are like um, folded once and then will drop down in the back. This is a much more mature um, way to fold it. So it's, I have a beautiful... I have a beautiful obi, but I'm not going to show you everything. Uh -huh. It's kind of like teasing. Right. But either way, these kimonos, when they're tying these obis, they're tied that way so that they can flow. So when they when they turn around and they, they show everything and they dip and everything, their, their obi is going to move with their dancing moves. So, that's so uh, interesting. Yeah, and I was, I was really, uh, watching his video, I was really surprised how their movements were not synchronized. The three of them yeah. at the very beginning, very end was synchronized, but in the middle, it was all different, like, like they were freestyling. Have you ever studied the, the dance styles or? Yeah, um, yeah, my grandmother was so kind as to, uh, to spend some time with me, uh, to teach me the, many of the dances that she learned to. Um, I, I noticed in the, in the photographs yesterday that, oh, this is, one of the um, the uh, the kind of an um, the sensu, uh, the ogi that they use ever in Gion. So this one is specific to geisha. So um, if you're going to learn Japanese dance, you usually won't find people who have this unless they come from a geisha background. It's a very simple white pattern with the red on the top. Benny, this is actually from Gion, um, but um, the, uh, the dances it very much depends. So you're going to have dances, for example, which use a, um, um, one of these. It's silver and gold is a very common theme, especially in, uh, in January, you'll notice. So you have these kinds of ogi, which are gold on one side and silver on the other. And they do this so that the synchronized or lack of synchronization in the dance between a number of people um, kind of flashes with every movement. So you want to see the the, um, the uh, oki flitter or flick or something like that. So most of these um, different kinds of oh, it depends on the person what kind of oki they're using and what kind of dance they're doing because the oki is kind of uh, it matches whatever dance they're doing. But the synchronization or the lack thereof is very much part of the dance itself. So um, it's. It's a matter of like who's dancing what part. It's like any sort of kind of a musical. Think of it like a musical routine, right? And these girls, they don't necessarily all practice at the same time. Maybe they're busy, maybe they're not. Some of them which do uh, synchronized dancing, and I have done a, a few of those too. Um, they practice at home, they get together, and they realize they're all off. <laughs> <laughs> and then they have to go through it again. But you kind of know the same ones. Right. There's only so many dances you have. So um, you get to, get to know these 
uh, movements, generally speaking. Yeah. No, I thought it was it was really interesting. It was the first time I'd seen the geisha and Michael dancing, so I, I was really appreciative that he had, I think, paid to see this performance and really seen them when they're ready to be seen. I think a, a lot of the reason uh, Kyoto banned the photography of Maiko and Geisha on the street is because it was so disruptive. And of course, they weren't ready to be photographed. It's like the cosplayers, right? You have to give them a chance to be prepared to take a photo. It's not There's really... There's actually a more practical reason. There's a more yeah. practical reason for that, actually. Um, when you call for a geisha, or a call for, a, well, here, we, let's go for the Michael, because the Michael, the more flashy girls, first of all, these are children we're talking about. They're under, they're under 20, they're under 18, possibly, you know, maybe even as young as 13, and um, they really shouldn't be harassed, right? They're very pretty, but they're not, they're not, um, they're not toys, you know? They're, uh, they're on their way to work, and they have a very, very strict schedule. A very very strict schedule so they get up early in the morning at six o'clock they get everything done they get their hair done because often they you know sleep on it in the wrong way and it falls down or they have to put on a wig or wigs are mostly only used by the michael now or the geiko right now not the michael but they have a very very strict schedule so if they're one minute late they get a scolding one minute late so that's the way it's always been and they do that to instill a um, respect for time Right. So the Michael, they really should be stopped, not even for one minute, not even for one second. Right. Because for those two reasons, they're children. They're not they shouldn't really be picked on like that. And of course, there's the time thing. But also as a gay, as a geisha or a gay girl, they say in Kyoto, um, the moment you call for one, uh, traditionally it used to be incense. So what would happen is they would light an incense at whatever um, restaurant or establishment they were at. And from the moment they lit the incense until the time they get to whatever establishment it is, that's time. And the whoever calls for these gauges is paying for that. So if they get stopped or anything like that, that's also an issue. Right. In yeah. addition to that, it's not just well, photographs. It, it's, it's such an interesting uh, traditional culture which needs to be preserved. And to be taking photos of them and stopping their work you're kind of impeding the culture and there's little benefit to them because they're not getting paid to stop and take tourist photos either. Um, but also, you know, having so many cars on all those small roads where they have to walk. I think there's, yeah. there's a few things that Kyoto could do to ban cars from certain areas, uh, maybe only allow rickshaws if it's a very classic area. Wouldn't that be beautiful? And part of the branding to keep just pedestrians or just rickshaws or well, there for example, the main entrance to Guillaume, which is you have the Dikia on the left side. On the right side, right across the street, is my friend's establishment. So um, that's where I go to see my geisha. And um, he often tells me the cars that go through there, those are only locals. And that's a real thing. So it's only a local or it's a um, or it's a taxi going to one of those local establishments. So the average car can't actually go in there. Oh, um, that's good. I didn't realize but, they're limiting that. Um, also, I, if you don't mind commenting on the little knife that is worn in kimono, because on Wednesday's talk with, with Paul Martin, he was mm -hmm. he's a samurai sword specialist, but he mentioned that there is a small sword that fits inside the kimono. Could you tell us a little bit about that? I apologize. I don't have my smaller um, uh, ogi. If I had it, then uh, I'd be able to show you. Um, well, this is a larger, much larger ogi, of course. But uh, the ladies, of course, we have to protect ourselves, too. Um, just as a man might carry a very big old you know, thingy, sword thingy, which is annoying. A lady, too, must have her secrets. And so right over here where you would usually put the um the the um ogi over here it's you, you could actually put two or more in here if you actually wanted to it's not a big deal it's not really a big you don't chosen there's only not only one way to do it but um you could also stick in tanka in there it's called tanka and you stick it inside of there and you kind of hide it daintily because you know ladies we don't have any weapons oh no of course not we wouldn't have anything like that but of course we do or they can put it over here on this side under it depends on how large you've got in the top so <laughs> something to hide it in 
Um, another um, theme that often comes up in, it's mostly in movies, so we don't know if that people actually did that, but um, to use a, a kanzashi, so you would have a knife in your kanzashi, in the hairpin that you use to put your hair together over here. Um, that's another common way to hide a thinner tanka, at least in film. I don't think I've seen that very much other yeah. in film. Uh, I, I saw that in Kill Bill, maybe. You know. <laughs> He's not wrong, actually. He, he plays around with the culture a lot, but he's not wrong. So. <laughs> That's yeah. so interesting. Okay, let's go to your stuff specifically, because we have a, a lot of great content to go through. Uh, we've already had a comment from Facebook, Yoshitsugu Fujiwara. Wow, interesting. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I love this graphic that you did for June in Japan. Do you want to introduce this to us? Oh wait, you're gonna have to show it to me. Hold on a second. So your okay. uh, oh, your PDF? the monkey ones. Yeah, I think a couple, a few months ago. I think I, um, it's part of. It started with tea because every month everything changes for tea. So you have to use a different kakegiku, like the one I'm using over here, or um, and different flowers and different foods and different colors. And of course, you change your kimono for every single month. And um, I was just looking through this and I realized well, those put lots of these things that I'm sure other people will be interested to hear about. And so I uh, just then started to list them up. And then I kind of created a format for it. I think it was um, three, four months ago I started to create a format for it. And in doing so, I got a very good response. A lot of people did indeed want to see it. So June in Japan, you're talking, um, since this is a brand new one, um, these are the flowers you're going to see. So Ajisai is, of course, a very dramatic flower. So a lot of people have this up on their timelines. And you have a lot of cutie. And uh, the Mizu, what is it? Minatsuki. Minatsuki is the name of the of this triangle suite you're going to see a lot in the uh, in wagashi shops or you'll see this people you go to Kyoto and they give you sweet there's always going to be a Minatsuki you're, you're going to get sick of it if you spend too much time in Kyoto I promise you it's <laughs> everything they do because actually the name of the month is Minatsuki and so to have a sweet which is the Minatsuki is kind of part of the fun but it's it's only delicately sweet and all the things that you're going to get they're very light very light and since it's so hot outside so you know um there's a lot of uh, humidity in the air so everything that you're going to be offered is something that's going to complement that humidity so even the tea you drink is going to be slightly lighter than usual or something like that and the tea is all about um enjoying the month that you're in so it's true we don't have sakura all year round but there are other different flowers that you can enjoy as well. So it doesn't always have to be sakura in order to enjoy the beauty of Japan. I think that um, doing these kinds of infographics might help other people to notice those elements. Yeah, I, lo I love how you're talking about the holidays and you're talking about the kinds of foods that you can enjoy as well as uh, the flowers and everything. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Your Your Twitter is is something that cheers me up every time I look at it because you have Thank such you. such beautiful insights into Japanese culture in such a, a beautiful retro traditional way but it's so it's so nice to apply to your modern life as well. It's not just stuck in the past. It's very applicable. So thank you so much for sharing that with thank us. You so much. I only want to share um, elements of the culture that I personally have in front of me. So I know that everybody can look up, um, oh, I don't know, I like to say the word sushi samurai geisha because it's something that everybody knows about and about Japanese culture. But I mean, it's not every day that you that you meet sushi samurai geisha. You know, you have um, all these other little things that makes Japan different than any other given country. And it's not something overt and it's not something that's in your face. It's very tiny. So those little tiny things are the things that may really make life here so much fun, don't you think? Yeah, I think so. And you recently moved house and you gave a neighborhood gift. Can you introduce oh. that? I love that. <laughs> well, um, when you first arrive uh, to any new location for a move, then it is it's it's not it's traditional, but it's it's still in practice to go around to the homes around you 
And uh, you do this ideally on the very first day you arrive because the moving itself is very noisy. So you're going to cause a lot of noise and you're going to probably block up the street and everything, especially these tiny Japanese streets. And so you go to each one of the neighbors which is closest to you and you ring the doorbell and you give them a, a specific kind of a gift. And the gift shouldn't be too expensive because you don't want to show off. You just want to show them your uh, your appreciation and your intention to be neighborly to them from now on. And so tell them your name and you say, and you explain, they you know, have little chit chats, like what's your hobby, where do you come from, uh, where are you moving from. Um, we have a tea house at this particular place, so I brought my tea teacher along with me when I was um, handing out the gifts. And um, some, a couple of the ladies, which were nearby my house, they also happened to do tea. So we planned for, uh, within a couple months, to open the tea house for everyone to come and visit. But it's a wonderful part of culture that I think that Tokyo especially is, is forgetting, especially when you live in apartments, because it's less common to go and say hello to all your neighbors in the apartments, especially if it's a large block apartment, too. But we do have a problem in society, and this isn't just limited to Japan, but Japan likes to focus on it a lot, of, um, of isolation. And people spend a lot of time by themselves in large cities. And I think it's partially um, fear, because you don't know who's out there, what's out there. Maybe the guy next door is a weirdo or something like that. You don't really want to involve yourself in, in those kinds of situations. And in addition to that, um, you want to protect yourself because, like I said, you know, it's a, there's a weird person next door. You don't want to deal with that. But it, it's uh, good to introduce yourself and to know who yeah. you have a connection, who you can kind of trust, who you might want to stay away from, right? I mean, it's it's all it's all getting information, and I think people have the most fear of things they don't know and That's things true. they assume or or people they haven't met. So. This is a wonderful way to just meet and greet quickly and form your alliances in your neighborhood. I love that. Um, you, have a, you have a great advice for where to get the gift. It was Guru Sugiri, Suguru Sugiri. Oh. So, um, I don't remember where I was. In Ginza, <laughs> yeah. I did the order them, so I'll look on oh, right. yeah. somewhere nice and far away, which is nowhere nearby, so they won't have the same suite again and again from the suites. And then order something, try to get something between, beneath 2,000 yen is, is kind of ideal, because you don't want right. to kind of be flashy about it. But um, I did notice that a lot of the people that I was, I'm in this area especially, they're older people, so older families and um, couples. And, so the retro, um, retro style suites maybe is better yeah. or, yeah. I do think so, yeah. yeah. It's mostly, it's about manners, so, you know, try to find something well, to defend it. When I, when I saw this, I thought, oh, I wish you were my neighbor. I, <laughs> I'm so happy to get the gift, but I've never, ever gotten anything besides soap. Or laundry oh, soap. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's it's yeah. practical or towels. Yeah, I'm not complaining. Yeah. But your gift was so beautiful and so you know traditional Japanese. I love that. Um, you also found some little mask, no mask, as you were unpacking. Can you introduce oh, yeah. that? Oh, I don't. I can't um, pull it out right now. But yes. Um, well, uh, I have an interest in no masks. Um, I actually prefer no to kabuki. So um, kabuki is beautiful and flashy, but um, no is much more esoteric. If you know what I mean, and it has a very long, much longer history. Um, also, a lot of the culture, cultural elements that are, um, you know, the, the study of light and shadows, for example, the lack of lighting in a Japanese house, for example, um, these are all elements of no, or which are incorporated into no. So the more you know about no, the more you know about um, modern Japanese culture as well. And um, the masks are just absolutely amazing. So this one in particular uh, was, a, it, it was, it has to be, See, since it was a, a, it's kind of complicated. Everything in Japan um, is who you know. So if you know someone who happens to know someone who is a, an, a, a living treasure, 
or something like that, and you mention to them that I very much like the no masks, which are done by so and so, and you express in not only an interest but a little bit of knowledge, like oh, okay, this person was working, and I know that his son is also doing the no masks right now, and he's and um, he made it for um, Ichikawa uh, the 14th. And if you mention these things as someone who also knows the person who's directly connected, that's actually a sign to them to um, please put out your feelers and see if they'd be willing to meet me. It's, it's one of those indirect requests for audience. It's really quite interesting. It's a fun little bit of politics in Japan that um, you either learn as you go or you don't. But um, that was, uh, I was able to find that particular item, which is not for sale. You can't find it just anywhere. Just because I was talking to the right person about no at the time and discussing masks and discussing love of kimono and how interesting it would be to have something which was a no mask here. But I don't think they make those, do they? And mm. then someone was like, well. Wonderful. And even the box is so beautiful. I love these storage boxes and yeah. how it has the, the kanji and the stamp from the mm -hmm. craftsman, I assume. And yeah, just beautiful. Um, you can get those made, by the way. If you have an item that you really love, uh -huh. you can get the box made. And you go and find someone who do some beautiful shuji. You can do it yourself if you have a lovely hand, but it's always nice to get someone professional. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I sometimes practice calligraphy and then I'm like, oh, it doesn't look bad. But then when you see someone who really knows how to do it, <laughs> it's completely different. Uh, let's have a look at some of your beautiful summer yukata and kimono. I think here you're at a festival. Uh, there is someone performing. Is it not kabuki? Some kind of performance is happening behind you. Um. Hold on just a second. Oh, here it's popping up. Oh, this is this is easy. This is the Autumn Festival in Kichijoji. So, um, in Kichijoji, in the first week or the, by the weekend in uh, actually September, when I just started to think about getting cool, it's not there yet, but just thinking about it, um, they, we have the Autumn Festival. And I volunteer during the Autumn Festival. I, um, I don't want to, I'm too old to carry the big old thing now, but um, I give out water and sweets to the people as they stop at each one of the stations. And um, we're, we're wearing a happy, and happy means you're someone who's participating in the festival. What I have behind me is called a, um, a, ito, a hayashi, a bayashi. And what it is, you have a whole band on a cart. And it's great. So you usually have someone with, you have um, drums always. And then you have flute over there. And you might have a shamisen over there. And people, be, and you might even have a dancer. So someone will put on a mask, usually of a shishi, um, a, a Chinese lion, a kind of a shishi thing. And then they'll be doing the, da the dance of the shishi in the back where they have the music being played. And this is being pulled along by usually a person or maybe a horse or even a cart. Depends. But um, these are ubiquitous when it comes to festivals. It's a lot of fun, really. Do come um, in the artist, or sorry, the Autumn Festival in Kichi Joji. I really appreciate that. And we'll wow. be there. <laughs> Wonderful. I love it. And I love the light green uh, yukata that you have on. And it has the asagao as well. Oh, thank you. Yeah. This is a very nice, I like these yukata. This one in particular has um, a lot of little holes in it. You can't see it in the photograph. But very tiny little holes, almost like lace. So they can't see what's underneath quite. But um, the wind gets in just not, just fine. So it's not hot at all. <laughs> it's gorgeous. Uh, your next kimono shot that you sent me is is absolutely beautiful. It's like a dark red color, and ah. it it has the is it the ginkgo leaf on the top? It is. Uh huh. Yeah, beautiful. <laughs> I love the ginkgo leaf. It's my favorite. Mm. Oh, it is. It is. It's. It's especially for this kind of color is actually for late, um, late summer. So when you're starting to move into autumn, uh, that's what. That's when you tend to see the darker color of yukata, and the ginkgo leaf is exactly. It's meant to um, show that it, we're we're heading over to the time the leaves are starting to fall. But this is the first one I ever bought. Actually, I took this picture when I was in Kyoto. In oh Kyoto. wow! Yeah. I love it. And I love your shoes. You, you're not wearing geta. You're just wearing simple sandals, probably more comfortable, maybe. These are geta. Oh, are they geta? geta. They look but, wonderful. Um, they look more comfortable. Yeah, you can get them carved to your foot. Oh, what? Yep, that's a thing. You oh. go to any get a specialty shop and say, I want something um, carved to my foot. And it doesn't cost that much more. Maybe eh, it'll cost a couple thousand yen extra. 
but um, they can actually carve it based on the imprint of your foot, so it doesn't hurt at all. It's wonderful. Wow. Wonderful. <laughs> and I notice you still, even though it's yukata, you still wear like a more traditional style obi. You don't wear like the super light um, mesh nut type or those types? do you do you change the type of obi in summer or you keep the same well, the style? Well, the one that um, is worn in this, during the summer with the ipata, it's not a rule, but it tends to be that people are going to wear a han obi. Mm -hmm. So a regular size obi is about this big, but then a han obi is half the size of that. And a han obi was originally worn, it's, it's a casual obi, right? So yukata, before they became the thing that they are now, were originally, um, they were uh, PJs, you know? You wear these for to sleep in. So you want something that's easy to tie, easy to take off, you go to the shower, you go to the fudal, whatever it may be, and you can still put them on very quickly. But um, this is, uh, it's not really that traditional. It's, it's, it really is, it's just a han obi, and it just happens to be in a dark color because yeah. I prefer them. Wonderful, but, you, you always make sense such beautiful combinations between colors and patterns and everything. You're very talented, yeah. creative lady. Oh, I, I love Thank it. <laughs> uh, I'd like to introduce the silk mask that you introduced from your friend. Ah. Um, oh yes, yes, I have a friend over in Kyoto, um, Lady Kato, and she has a um, she has a um, kimono shop over in Kyoto. Most kimono shops are actually in Kyoto, so the ones which are over here, if you want to get a kimono made, the fabric is sent to Kyoto to get done, and then it comes back, almost always. And um, she has one which is a kimono shop just for men. However, um, she just had some free time, and of course it was coronavirus time, nothing to do, but lots of fabric. She goes, I'm going to make some masks, and she used it with the material she had at hand. And what's interesting about these masks is that um, it's not uh, it, it's not polyester and it's not cotton, it's not gauze. It, it's instead done all by silk. And that, I didn't really think much of it. I thought it would be kind of too hot for this kind of weather. But when I put it on, I realized not only did the ears not hurt, these are really soft, like gentle cords you have here, but the air, it passes through differently. And I don't know how, but it's not hot. You don't get that kind of misty, murky feel in front of your lips. It's kind of like a lot more um, breezy. And it was so wonderful. I thought, goodness gracious, this is even better than the stuff that you get from the packages, right? So I asked her to make a couple for my husband, and we came up with the gray and the, and the white. And first he didn't want to put them on because he thought the same thing. He was like, it's going to be too hot, you know, it's double layered and all these things. But he put it on, now that's his favorite one. This is my favorite one too now. So. And, you know, she just sent them to me randomly because this is what people here do. They'll send you things randomly and then you send something back. And, and it's like, this is going to be useful for you. And it really was. So yeah, it's beautiful. Fun. And then you have the, the website here, otokokimonokato.com. And, yes, uh, yeah, so that's easy <laughs> to remember. Men's kimono kato, right? Yes, that's right. <laughs> Also, what's nice about her shop is she makes large size kimono. So, um, because she's a men's kimono shop, I ordered my things from there too, because I'm not a small girl. <laughs> so, um, but men, especially, especially foreign men who are the larger persuasion like myself, um, if you're really tall, then you're having a trouble because all your kimonos are so short, right? Mm -hmm. But if you go to her shop, she has all those, everything which is made for larger gentlemen and taller oh, gentlemen. That's good to know. Around. Yeah. When, when I have tried even yukata or kimono, um, I often get the comment, your shoulders are too broad or we don't have one that big, you know. So it's it definitely you need a larger size if you have a larger frame. So that's, that's a great resource. Thank you. Uh, we got a good comment from Mikiko. She says, you look like you were born to wear kimono. Fantastic. Thank you very much. You're very <laughs> kind. <laughs> Gorgeous. Um, let's 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 talk a little bit about wagashi because I think that's a, a mutual love that we both oh. have. Um, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, very interesting. You were talking about Hungary, yes. the designs, uh, and then your idea for some wagashi. Do you want to introduce mm -hmm. that story? Oh, yes. Well, um, I, I'm a third-generation Hungarian, 
So um, I'm not directly from Hungary, neither are my parents, but I spent some time there when I was younger because my father was an economist. So he went there after the wall fell in 92 and he brought me along as I was the oldest daughter, and, you know. So I went over there and I experienced a lot of Hungarian culture, which was also passed down to me from my grandmother. And um, since that time, of course, I've had, you know, in the back of my mind, um, I am Hungarian, right? And so that's why the name Paprika Girl comes from. That's a very Hungarian spice. Okay. And I thought, well, there's a lot of, there are many elements of Japanese des um, Hungarian design which could also be incorporated into, um, for example, uh, into Japanese um, items. So, for example, I mentioned before that um, kimonos, they don't have to be made of Japanese material. They can be made of any material. So if I were to go to Hungary and buy some material, I could make it into kimono, and that would be okay. And so I was thinking about, well, what if I could apply this to a tea ceremony? And it was um, from, uh, yes, uh, it was Camellia tea ceremony in Kyoto, which first showed these beautiful whisks which had a, the, the um, well, I wish I had a picture. <laughs> they had these, um, the, the strings which tie the kimono or the whisk together are red, white, and green. Those are Hungarian colors in addition to uh, Italian colors. But that made me think, well, what else, if I could get something like that, well, how else could I apply Hungarian motifs to it? And so the wagashi, with getting back to the wagashi, um, wagashi are very versatile. So they don't have to make it in any, any particular shape or style or, anything like that. So there are a lot of these large Hungarian flowers, these red and yellow ones that we have. Um, you can see on the picture right in the middle. Those would do very well in nerikiri, so the big, rich, um, poofy, white Japanese sweets. And then, of course, you have the smaller leaves over here on the side. And if you could, it's a very uh, tiny kind of a pattern, so it wouldn't be good for nerikiri. But you can see over here we have these uh, the yokan, this clear tome yokan over here. They have in this yokan, it has a momiji pattern, but it's perfectly acceptable to cut the cut the shapes into these Hungarian patterns and instead uh, make a swirling Hungarian pattern into the yokan. Mm. So that is very applicable. And if you want to know, you know you also put down the head in the um, uh, bowl there. But well, everything you use in the, in the tea ceremony has to be designed. So they're not just putting down the chawan there just because they have a chawan. This particular chawan is good because it's for, because let's say with sustainability. We're talking about green and about growth and about um, about uh, the simplicity of nature. So all these are themes that you're going to incorporate into your tea ceremony. So I'm hoping that I, you can use whatever kind of plate you want. You don't have to have a Japanese plate or Japanese chawan in order to do a tea ceremony. So I could use this Herendi uh, Hungarian porcelain on which to put these, Jap these Hungarian design, Hungarian motif inspired sweets and give them to the guests. And then, of course, the kakejiku, which is the um, scroll in the back. It's kind of dark, so I don't know if you can see this one. Um, it says, time waits for no man. Okay. Basically, essentially, right? Yeah. But, um, I love but that. It's, like, it's hard to explain what they are. Some of them are, are Buddhist uh, messages. Some of them are letters. Some of them are, are pictures and paintings. But I was thinking over the last night, what would be an appropriate kakejiku? And there are some wonderful pieces in the, made from the 17th century, 18th century, about when the foreigners first came to Japan. So there's, I think it was on Twitter the other day that somebody posted a, um, a, a beautiful piece of national art. Well, not, I don't think it was national art, but it was a very famous piece. Um, when you had the first meeting between the foreigners, the Japanese, I think the Chinese um, delegates, and they were all at one table. And so if you really, if I were really to start moving forward on such a project, I would find out who owns that, and I would borrow it specifically for a tea ceremony, mm -hmm. just because it has a theme of connection between the Japanese and the West. So tea ceremony would be a lot of fun to do with um, incorporating some sort of Hungarian elements, and it's very versatile. So. Yeah, and I love that idea of borrowing uh, plates or borrowing a very expensive items so that you can share use, which is also, of course, very sustainable. And of course, these beautiful plates are high quality. They're made by craftspeople. Uh, they're used for a very long time, just like kimono. These are all the elements of sustainability we were talking about last time. Yeah.
uh, the first yeah. thing that got me, oh, I was going to Go say ahead. that the first thing that got me into it in the first place is I was over at a, at a tea master's house and he gave us, get, handed me a cello on. He says, and here, have a drink. Because I had a drink. It was wonderful. And um, he says, well, this was made during the Heian period. So it's 1,200 year old bowl. I'm like, <laughs> I'm not going to drop it. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, very I special. <laughs> yeah, isn't isn't that amazing? And it's it's wonderful that like in in my grandmother's house when I grew up, I was never allowed to touch anything inside the glass case, right? <laughs> like that was china that nobody is ever going to use. We're just going to look at it. Sometimes it's dusted, but quite often in Japan, you'll be served in these beautiful plates or dishes or serving ware that has you know so much value and also so much heritage for them it's so wonderful to see it in use and you just have to be careful <laughs> well, while you nice. use you it just like hide it away for a special occasion because who knows what that's going to come that's today um someone mentioned nichi nichi kore kore, it's a, every day a good day but um it's true i mean every single day could be the very last day of your life or it could be the first day of your life or you don't know what's going to happen so treat every single day as if it's important and it's worthy of using the special china yes definitely <laughs> uh one thing we didn't have time to talk about last time is cho cho chi kuyo <laughs> house yeah, the Chou Kuyo. <laughs> it's hard to say. Can you yeah. introduce that? Because that's a f fantastic initiative. It is. This was um, designed in uh, in 1920. Um, uh, during so it was during the Taisho period, I think. And um, what's interesting is Japanese uh, architecture in general, including the house that I just moved into, uh, it tends to be built in such a way so that if you open up all the windows, you don't even need any coolers. You don't need AC. You don't need anything like that. Um, you have a lot of uh, uh, air coming in to the house in general. Well. Um, the Chotikyo was designed not only in a Western style, a Western design, but it was also designed in such a way that incorporates Japanese style of um, using the geothermal, natural geothermal energy, as well as the, uh, the, um, the, the muki, I'm gonna, the direction of the house and the flow of air. Um, so that you're not going to need any heating or um, or cooling, except in very exceptionally cold or exceptionally hot days. So um, that was done a long time ago. So what I'm trying to show you with that one was that, or even during the 1920s, people were very much aware of uh, of net of ways to um, incorporate the uh, more sustainable methods of um, lighting and cooling and heating. That's another thing. Um, the windows as well, you have your desk positioned towards the window in such a way so that you don't need any lamps. So that's another element of that very same house, which even though it's a Western style house, it's using those Japanese elements so that it, um, uh, so that it, it, it basically uses no energy and yet it's perfectly livable. That's beautiful. And I, I love the the idea of it, using the windows, using the breezes, the direction yeah. of breezes, using plants around, but also oh. using geo geothermal yeah. energy. I mean, that's so before its time. Even now, we rarely find places cooled or heated from geothermal. It makes a lot of sense because under the ground to the area where it's tapped is a constant temperature all year. So yes. if you use geothermal, it keeps your home at that constant temperature. So it, it makes such sense, especially somewhere like Japan, where we should be able to tap into that quite easily. But I wish it was used more. So this was yeah, this, such an inspiration. It was it's sad that, um, well, there was a time period, it was during the, I was going to say it's during the bubble, and any young person is going to say it's the bubble generation that messed up the world. But... But um, during the bubble period, they were especially interested in the Western. And they didn't, it, Western architecture matches Western um, uh, environment. You understand? So um, the reason that things were built in brick was because the environment is good for brick. You know, it's not going to fall over, you know, and, the, and it won't get cracked during the earthquakes and things like that. And it's a colder area, so you need that kind of a... Um, 
uh, insulation, but they didn't. They the people during the during that era, especially, they were more interested in the visual effect of it. So they brought in all these elements into the uh, modern architecture, which really weren't necessary. Right. So now the younger generation, I would see, especially um, at those of the Ushinawaratajun and the the um, the lost generation, as they say in Japanese right now, anyone between the age of 35 up to 45, I assume, um, those people are the ones who are looking for the older architecture, looking for that which grandma lived in, you know. So you're going to see, I think, I hope we're going to see, uh, you know, a little bit more of an increase in those sorts of yeah. homes. I hope now. so, too. It's an absolutely beautiful place as well, and it's been around since the 1920s, so it's doing well. Well, you can go and visit it, by the way. Um, it, you have to do, uh, I think you have to make a reservation. So it's not necessarily open all the time, but if you make a reservation, they'll show you and they'll bring, um, and they'll uh, give you a tour of it as well. So I do recommend going to see that. It's in Kyoto, by the way. Okay. So yeah. Those are Wonderful. Uh, you also shared about your paper decorations. Can you introduce that? Oh, that? Oh, well, um, there's this little paper shop, which is in Kichijoji, and every month they they change the decorate, they change the theme of the little paper items they have there. And you can't you can't always change everything in your house, and of course some of them are very expensive to change everything in your house. But to to spend a little little bit of money on just these tiny little paper decorations that will show you what's coming what's coming up this season, you can see just a little tiny piece of wax. Mm -hmm. There's a little bit of Japanese stuff, but just, you know, you can do this on a regular basis, and it's not going to break the bank. And um, in addition, it's, of course, Japanese paper, it's washi, so uh, it's all made in Japan, and people who are crafting those things probably work behind the counter, and it's, it's really worth that little effort, and it makes the house just that much nicer, you know? I love it. It's adorable. And then, mm -hmm. like you pointed out, you can see the ripples in the water. They made a ripple effect. Did you say you found these in Loft? That's right. Mm -hmm. This is um, in Kichijoji. It's the fifth floor of Loft. Um, there's the entire paper shop there. So you can get everything. You can get bags and hats made out of paper over there. You can get, um, I buy my kaishi, which are the white papers you use for tea ceremony and put into the pocket here. That's called a kaishi. Um, I buy those there. You can buy fans there. You can buy, um, all, all, you'd be surprised what's made out of washi. You know, so you get all those little you get hairpins and all things. And it's quite a cute little place. Wow. Yeah, we um, interview well, in uh, interview this on Tuesday, we talked to an artist, and she paints on washi, and she yeah. she paints some of the sliding doors the in the old traditional house, and she yeah. uses washi paper. And I had never heard of that for painting, so it is well, very versatile, isn't it? It is. You should, oh, you've got to, you've done calligraphy before, so you know the, the feel of a brush on washi. It's so different than regular paper. It just kind of, it, it's, it spreads in just the right way. And really good washi doesn't spread a lot. It spreads just a little bit. So it's, it's so elegant and it's so alive at the same time. It really is wonderful stuff. Yeah, wonderful. <laughs> uh, Keizo from Periscope, thanks for joining. He says hello from Osaka. And he Hi, says hello. they are adorable your paper <laughs> decorations. They really are. Thank you so much. <laughs> there's um beautiful these these little ajisai at the front. Those are actually scented. Oh. So you can buy them just to put in your bag too if you want to send your bag. So that's another use for them. I just want to mention that. <laughs> that's wonderful. My favorite wagashi that you treat tweeted about recently I have to share is this Fish in a well, wagashi. Oh, oh it's, it's, it's current now. This is when you can buy these. Oh, my goodness. Oh. Please tell us more. I love this. Well, you're going to find a lot of well themes right now this month because it's water, and everyone wants to hear about water because everyone's hot. So um, you're going to find some sweets. Some will be filled with jelly to have a water effect. Some will have flowers on it to make, make it look like a... a a, what do you call it? Um, uh, hasu. hasu. Mm, you can't think of the word for hasu in English. What was it? Anyway, they have flat water flowers and water lilies on top of there. Um, this one in particular represents Ayu, 
And IU is going to be in season, depends on the area it changes, it's usually the second or third week of the, um, of the year, or of this particular month. And um, IU travels upstream, right? So what you're seeing is a jumping IU. It's representing the jumping IU, and it's going over the the, um, the bubbling brook. It's what it's supposed to be looking like. So there isn't one particular name for this kind of thing, but if you look for anything under the um, name Edo, so if you go to any Japanese wagashi shop and ask for an Edo item, it's going to be found here and now during this season. Mm. And I love and so, that you said the upper right angle of the fold gate is a gate to evil. Is that right? Uh, yes. <laughs> oh my goodness. So you see the the wooden board which I put down beneath the wagashi. This wooden board here has a fold on the upper right. It's always the upper right. You don't put it on the bottom right or on the left or anything like that. Um, this is a directional thing. I think it originally comes from China way back when. But the upper right or the northeast is, is the gate to evil. It's the gate to hell. So, um, a Tohoku, if there's anything from Tohoku, don't turn your back on the Tohoku. Some, wow. some people are very suspicious about it. But that, um, it's a design which says, okay, we're, we're going to protect this corner. So, so that whatever you're imbibing now and that those people which you are now spending time with, there's going to be no evil in this group whatsoever. So, yeah, yes, <laughs> the kimon. <laughs> wow, it's so interesting. I'm fascinated by all of your... Wagashi. Um, people on Periscope have been commenting, you must do tea ceremony to have such beautiful wagashi. I think they, they know. And uh, <laughs> Keizo says, Ayu is David's favorite fish. Oh, really? Yeah. You'll like it even better when it's in sweetie. You know? <laughs> <laughs> when it's in sweet form, yeah. Um, <laughs> you also talked about amazake and natto recently. Can you, <laughs> in like a, a similar tweet, but I, I thought it was so interesting. You want to introduce um, that? Um, amazake, um, you see that a lot during the winter. You see less during the summer because it tends to be heated, but um, it's it's an um, early form of uh, fermentation for um, rice. So when you're making sake, you make, this comes out first. And it's, it's um, usually served relatively sweetened. And um, what's interesting about the Japanese love fermentation stuff. It's really good for you. It's good for your skin, good for your hair. Um, yogurt is a, like a Western version of that kind of thing. Of course, anything that's fermented in cheese is too. But um, natto as well is also a fermented item. Uh, they have a lot of that in Japanese food. I'm not too fond of natto. Um, but <laughs> I can definitely tell you that the amazaki is available now, and it's, it's very good for your tummy. So early in the morning, if you don't know what you want to drink, and water, of course, you, water is water, but um, you can drink that early in the morning, and it won't feel heavy. It won't feel like you just wasted a drink of something. It's, it's really quite comfortable to drink that. But, a lot of um, women swear by amazaki that it's, okay. it's so good for your skin as well as your gut, right, because of the bacteria. So I think anything fermented like natto, amazake, in the picture as well, you have aloe, which is a fabulous thing to use in summer. Oh, ho, ho, ho. So this is nice, so nice. Oh, this, this particular this cup here? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Those are cheap, by the way. You can get them anywhere. Mm -hmm. So definitely, it, it retains the cool uh, the, the temperature of the original drink. So yeah, I do recommend yeah. that. I love that. So uh, try amazake. It's not alcoholic. It's fermented. No. It's good for you. So if you're not going to try the natto, you can always try the amazake, right? Yes. Well, the amazake, I also want to mention that when women swear by it, I will swear to you that if you drink this over three days, if you've got a pimple, suddenly, beep, you got a pimple, and you're like, oh, my God, what am I going to do? Well, if you have drinks amazake in the morning over three days, I swear it's gone. It's gone. I swear. So I <laughs> understand those ladies when they say that they swear by it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'm not keen on it, but I will drink it because I know it's good for me. And yeah, it's, I prefer it to natto. Uh, let's, <laughs> let's, let's talk about the Asagao green wall that you spotted the other day in Toyohashi. This was yesterday, yes. Oh, okay. Um, I was uh, filming in Toyohashi. I'm now back in Tokyo. But I was filming in Toyohashi and I just turned around, I was going to the studio, I turned around and right behind me is this 
it's this amazing wall of green. It went all the way up. And so the building behind it is very old and it looks like it's about to be knocked down. But um, you could see it just climbing and it was alive and it was stretching all the way to the top. And you could see its beautiful purple tendrils going all the way up to the fourth floor. And I don't think I've ever seen a flower that went that high. It's absolutely gorgeous. Right in front of you in the rich purple color of that flower. It's like, I'm alive. Yeah. It's just something that you just don't see every day. No, and it's a fabulous thing to grow for the summer heat. And I see oh. that you're growing some at your new place. You have your little seeds are sprouting, so. I need to go check them today. I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> so hopefully just, yours are growing as high up on your house someday. Oh, Who knows? One day, one day. They just started like a week ago, so. <laughs> I hope that they do too. <laughs> yeah. One day I'll post pictures. And I'll post pictures as they spread. If you put the lattice, I was talking to the gardener, and he said that if you put the lattice up now, um, you're still going to be able to get a big green curtain by um, by uh, August. Oh, that's good so news. It's not late. So yeah. um, I'm going to keep that up. And if you really take care of them, they're going to grow over the years as well, too. So I want to see how far I can get my, my flowers to grow. Yeah, <laughs> wonderful. Um, I picked out one last kimono to talk about right before the end. So you're wearing a unique linen hitoe kimono. Can you tell us some about this? Well, um, uh, I would, as I mentioned before, kimono can be made out of any material you like. So it doesn't have to be silk or it doesn't have to be asa, it doesn't have to be anything in particular. But this one was made out of linen, so it's washable. And um, I'm actually wearing the same one right now, so. <laughs> but um, it's a washable kimono, and it's very light and fluffy, so you know, not heat at all. But what's nicest about it is um, that since it's letting the air in, you don't stand there looking like you're really, really hot. You stand there very comfortably and cool. And looking like that makes the people who are around you also feel cool. Oh, it's not its not one of those hot days. It's one of those cool days. Ah, I can enjoy this weather too. That's the kind of impression you want to give to the people who are around you. Yeah, it's beautiful. Uh, and then you have a glass bead on the oh, yeah. obi. That's gorgeous. Um, yeah, right from now on, up until the end of summer, you're going to see a lot of people with glass obidome. It's supposed to look like a droplet of water or give you an image of a droplet of water, uh, which of course is cool for summer. And it's a very inexpensive thing, but it means it makes all the difference just to have a little piece of it. So, oh, yeah, gorgeous. Yeah, so nice those. yeah, thank you so much for sharing these wonderful oh. photos. <laughs> and all of your insight into kimono, someday I might start wearing one regularly, but I don't know if I can do it. You do it so beautifully. <laughs> Such an inspiration to all of us. Aww. Well, it's not hard. I mean, you just get the basics. You're going to have to go out and get yourself a cheap set of clips and stuff because, you know, it's different than Western wear, so you have to think in a different direction. But once you've got the clips and stuff, go to the old kimono shops, buy yourself the thousand yen ones, start experimenting with it and trying it again and again and again and again. And you'll find the sizes and the styles that best fit you and how you want to feel in kimono. So it's very an individualized experience, and I hope you can get into it. It's very fun. Thank you. Yeah, I'd love to. Some, someday. You inspire me. Uh, Ke, <laughs> Keizo says, is it Hisui Obidome? Hisui. No, it's not. It's not Hisui. This is just glass. <laughs> it's not. But I would love to have a Hisui one, one day <laughs> if I'm really lucky. <laughs> Um, you were also, uh, we have a few more minutes. You were talking about the new normal at your work. So you have oh, social distancing yeah. and you want to talk a little bit about that? Oh, sure. Um, yeah. What, well, it was, it was the first time I went back to a movie set since, um, uh, since the coronavirus thing happened. And we're doing a number of things in order to try to prevent the spread of uh, or creation of a cluster. And we're limiting staff for one thing. We don't have as many people as we usually do. And we all have to wear masks at all times. Um, we also have hand sanitizer everywhere. We don't have snack tables, which is the second part, because everyone wants snacks, of course, but you know that's where people tend to congregate. In addition, you have people touching things and, and chips and sweets and things like that, so we don't have snack tables either. And um, we also are encouraged to stand apart from each other. So um, 
and try to stand and at least a meter away. The producer walks through going, Mitsu, Mitsu, Mitsu all the time, which means <laughs> we're too close, we're too close, we're too close. <laughs> but we're trying our best. But yeah, I think it's going to be a new normal for a while. Yeah. Um, well, it, it looks yeah. like you've got your, your good mask on and you're using the hand sanitizer and yeah. trying to social distance. I've seen more and more Japanese businesses trying to get back to some kind of new normal, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's, trying to do it as casually as possible is important. Otherwise, it's gonna, it's not going to be sustainable. Yeah. You know, people are not going to want to continue it. So, yeah. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> it's difficult, but I think there are certain ways we can move forward to keep people safe and find, so. find some yeah. way. Yeah. Thank it's you. You can't just stop life. You know, you have yeah. to move on and we'll try to find a new way to do it. Yeah. Thank you so much for all of your insight once again into the wonderful world of traditional Japan in our modern world. So I appreciate that. And if, arigatou gozaimasu. And if you're interested in following um, Paprika Girl, she's very active on Twitter. So please find her on Twitter. Thank you everybody for joining. Thank you for all your wonderful comments and questions. Uh, we are back today at 5 o'clock talking to Mac. He's a travel agent, so talking about tours and the future of tourism in Japan. So please join us. Thank you so much. Have a good day, everybody. Thank you, Paprika Girl. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day.